Hello. Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the research papers presentations presented by MLB. Um, today, we're going to have Benjamin Foster of UNC um, talk about analytics for the front office, valuing protections on NBA draft picks. Uh, the presentation will be 20 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes for Q&A. Uh, so please help me in welcoming Benjamin. Thanks, Jonah. Um, I'm glad they served you guys sandwiches before this talk, so I'm not standing between you and lunch. Um, if this doesn't work, my co-author is back there to save me. There we go. Um, so uh, like Jonah said, I'm Ben Foster. I'm a PhD student actually in environmental sciences and engineering. Um, and I'm going to talk about our work where we take some theories um, and methods from financial asset pricing um, and try to use those to produce a value of protecting NBA draft picks. When I say value, I don't mean monetary value. I mean basketball value, so in some term of player uh, value uh, or player value metric. And so I want to make that clear up front. Um, and my, again, my co-author, Michael Binns, uh, is here. Um, he's a consultant at North Highland um, in Philadelphia. So uh, we're interested in, in doing this because draft picks are important assets in the trade market. And that's why we use player value, because often they're used uh, to trade for players. Um, and I'll bring in the most prolific trader of NBA draft picks, Ted Stepien, to help me uh, give you a little uh, background here. Um, so a draft pick is a colloquial term uh, that the NBA more uh, precisely defines as a right to make a draft choice. I will use draft pick throughout this talk. Uh, but I wanted to make that clear up front. Um, and each year, every team gets this right um, in both rounds of the NBA draft. Of course, it's not tied to a particular draft slot, what we call a pick position. And that is determined after the season as a function of standings and a lottery process for those top 14 picks. OK, so teams, uh, as I mentioned, can trade their first round draft picks, although there are some restrictions on that now, thanks to our friend Ted. Um, but what is most interesting, I think, is that when they trade those draft picks, they're allowed to add something called protections to the draft picks. So these are conditions on the transfer of the draft pick based on its pick, predict, pick position. And the easiest way to understand these is through an example. Um, and we'll, we'll use this throughout the talk. So this is the Lakers 2015 first round pick. It was initially traded to the Suns for Steve Nash in 2012. It was then traded from the Suns to the Sixers in 2015 at the trade deadline. So that's the kind of reference point is that 2015 trade deadline. I think I'm feeding back. I'll move over here. Um, but that pick was protected top five in 2015. Uh, which means if the Lakers were to end up with the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth pick, they would get to keep it. The Sixers, in this case, would not get the pick that year. It would roll over. Oh, this is a conundrum. It works when I'm over here, but then I feed back. Um, uh, it would roll over to the next uh, years where it was top three protected for a couple years and then unprotected in 2018. So we call this combination of things a, the base draft pick, the Lakers 2015 first round pick, plus its protection scheme, a draft pick asset. And this is the thing we're interested in analyzing. All right, my co-author is back there, and I think I'm just going to flag him to switch uh, slides. So uh, what are the benefits of protections to understand that? Uh, we need to understand uh, what a base draft pick looks like. Um, it, and it looks like a distribution of possible pick position outcomes. So at some point in the middle of the year, you're uncertain how you're going to finish. You're uncertain the results of the draft lottery. And so this is what your, pick or your draft pick looks like. If you were to trade it, you'd be giving a team this set of probable outcomes. Um, and so if we uh, think about this in a trade context, this has a single value. You could trade this for, for something. Teams would evaluate it with one single value. But if you add protections, you can change the distribution of picks. Um, so this is one protection scheme. Uh, we've got a couple more uh, coming here. Um, and you can do this a bunch of different ways. It turns out there are actually millions of ways to do this, um, uh, of protection schemes, which means you can take that base draft pick and give it millions of different values in a, uh, as a trade asset. So uh, why this is uh, particularly valuable um, is that the uh, trading in the NBA is a difficult thing to do. Um, there's lots of reasons why. Um, it's a barter system. There's lots of restrictions from the NBA um, and part of the bylaws and in the CBA. There's a good reason to do this, from, but from a market efficiency standpoint, we would say that this is a really illiquid market. It's very difficult to make transactions, to buy and sell when you want to buy and sell at market rates. 
Um, and so, uh, but PIC protections are this one thing that appears uh, or ought to increase the likelihood of a transaction occurring. So if you imagine you're a team, uh, oh, it's flying through, okay. If you imagine you're a team uh, and you're uh, trying to trade for some medium value asset, but you only hold very high value and very low value assets, it might be very difficult for you to assemble a package uh, that will make that transaction occur. Uh, with pick protections, you can take some of those high or low value assets, raise or lower their value, increasing the likelihood you might be able to execute a trade. Um, so, of course, teams understand this, um, and they use pick protections all the time. Um, this was a figure that we first started this project looking at, um, and was really the motivation. We've kind of updated a couple times since, but uh, this is picks traded from 2011 to 2017, their level of protection across the x-axis, and the number of picks across the y. And you'll notice uh, that there's these three kind of clusters. That's top five protected, top 10 protected, and top 14 protected. Um, we found this quite interesting, right? If teams are using protections to tailor the value of a draft pick to particular trade circumstances, it's quite odd that lots and lots of trade circumstances required a top 10 protection as opposed to top nine or top 11, where there's actually only one top 11 protection in this data set. Um, and so we thought maybe there ought to be a more smooth distribution. And our hypothesis for why this situation might be the case is that teams have a difficult time quantifying, uh, precisely at least, the difference between, say, top nine, top 10, and top 11. As a result, you end up on a round number. We call these psychological anchors in the paper. So we got five and 10, and 14 is a, a basketball number, uh, which we call a round number here. So uh, we thought about, well, could we come up with a way to calculate the value? or the difference between, say, a top nine versus a top 10 protection, top 11 versus top 14. And this motivates our primary research question, uh, which is how valuable are pick protections on NBA draft picks. And our strategy for answering this question is to build out a system that can value, systematically value draft picks with any protection scheme. We call this a price. And as I mentioned before, this is a basketball price, so that we're not confused uh, that we're going to think about money here. Um, okay, and our purpose, before we get into some of the methods, I want to remind, uh, keep this at the forefront of your mind, is to help inform team decision making about where you might place protection. So could you better decide how to protect a pick when you trade it away, or how to protect a pick when you're trading for it? Okay, so uh, the basis of our modeling is this insight that protected draft picks are like financial options. So if you imagine a world in which you just want to write down how will, uh, what is the value of a draft pick asset? You might say, well, it's gonna be a function of the protections, this contractual artifact um, of the, the draft pick asset and that draft pick's future position. So what we really care about here is the volatility of that position, right? How probable is it that it will fall within or outside of the protections? This turns out parallels pretty closely to how we think about option value, so financial option value. Um, there's a strike, which we don't need to know the details of, but is analogous to protections as a contractual artifact. Um, and then the underlying asset's future value. Again, we care about the volatility of that future value. Um, that is the likelihood, for example, that it might exceed the strike value. So Nobel Prizes have been awarded for describing the mathematics behind these option value formulas. I don't think there will be one awarded for describing this, the mathematics behind draft pick asset values. But uh, we also don't want to use the math directly. It applies very specifically to these types of assets. Um, so we use kind of the principles that underlie that math and adapt them with our own uh, methods uh, to, to price out these draft picks. So these are kind of broadly the three principles that we use. Uh, we first characterize the volatility in the underlying asset, um, then assess the impact of the contractual conditions, those are protections, um, and then account for market risk to boil that all down into a single price or a single value. This is what our system looks like. Um, we've got, and this is roughly how they fit into those three uh, principles. Um, these gray boxes here contain a lot of details. You can find them in the paper. You can find them on our poster, um, but I'm going to try to keep it relatively high level. If I'd started here, you guys would have all left five minutes ago. Um, but the important piece here are these, are these, are these first two modules, um, are that they describe two sources of uncertainty uh, that we're worried about. So the first is where will a team finish in the standings? And the way we model this is using an ELO, ELO rating system-based model that simulates M an NBA season um, and allows us to estimate the probability distribution of the team's ultimate standings position. Now, this is inverse for us. So when we say one, that means the worst team in the league. This lines up better with how picks are, are doled out. 
Um, so I'll bring it back to that Lakers 2015 pick at the trade deadline. We simulate the 20 or so odd games left for every NBA team. We do that 10,000 times and end up with this distribution of possible finishing positions for the Lakers. Okay, so the second module here is pick position valuation. Um, this is trying to account for how valuable a player could be picked at any position, right? The first pick, you can end up with Anthony Bennett or LeBron James. We might want to capture that variability. And we do so by building out these cumulative probability distributions. Um, in our case, we use win shares. It's simple to interpret. You could use whatever metric you want here, proprietary metrics, PER, whatever you think is important. But the important piece is to be able to build these cumulative probability dis distributions. Um, and we did so using historic data for basketball reference. We indexed it by pick position, so when the player was picked, and that's how we built them out. So, of course, here we've got Tim Duncan and LeBron James at the far end of this curve, and Anthony Bennett's down low, and Andrew Bogut falls about there um, on this distribution. And we can do this for every pick. So we do it every pick out to pick 30. We're, we're just worried about the first round here, um, and that's in bright red. Okay, so we've captured the uncertainty in these two modules um, at the top here. Um, and we feed that into a Monte Carlo simulation. We run that 10,000 times. And this is where we account for lottery probabilities and protection schemes. Um, I'll give you the very coarse overview of what goes on here. Uh, we start with that output from module one. And we feed that through uh, the way we account for draft lotteries and the protection scheme. Uh, combine that with the output from module two and the result um, is this value generated by pick assets. So this is an important piece right here. I'll actually blow this up and look at it in more detail. Um, so this is win shares over the first five years of a player's career. I think I forgot to mention that. We sum win shares over the first five years of their career. This is our player value metric that we're interested in. Um, and it's the, those win shares, simulated win shares, uh, generated by the specific pick asset. So that Lakers pick with its protections. And to interpret this, you might say, Okay, this bar here represents uh, a 16.8% chance that the Sixers, in this case, who own this pick, would be able to draft a player with it um, who contributes between 17.5 and 21.5 and win shares over their first five years. Okay, so that's the main output from this Monte Carlo simulation, and that feeds into our financial asset pricing model. So the goal here is to take that distribution of outcomes and boil it down into a single value. Um, and I'll do that in two, I'll show how we do this with two uh, distributions. So this is that protected pick that we've been talking about. And I'll also show a counterfactual, which is the unprotected 2015 Lakers pick. So this doesn't exist because they traded that protected pick, but we can compare the two and estimate how valuable protections were uh, by doing this. So uh, the first way you might think about boiling this distribution down is to take the expected value or the mean of this distribution so that, those are the black lines there. But the issue is that doesn't account for the variance um, in the distribution. And you might care about that because these really big outcomes here um, are the result of picks one through three, which essentially get ruled out of this protected case because of the protections. This is the chance of getting LeBron James or someone who might change your, your franchise's history. So you might want to weight that a little bit when you assess the, the, the value of this pick. To do that, we use something called the Wang transform. It's a financial asset pricing model um, that we use because it works very well for empirical distributions. And it just has a single assumption, which is called the market price of risk. Um, and this is the math, uh, but the important piece here is this uh, highlighted gamma value. This is that one assumption. It can be uh, represented as the sharp ratio, which is something you can calculate um, if you're worried about stocks or corporate bonds or something, heavily traded instruments. Uh, you can calculate this. But we're interested in the uh, more general interpretation of the market price of risk, which is, uh, can be understood kind of generally as the risk preferences of the market. So now we need to figure out how the NBA trade market values different draft pick positions. Um, we don't think that they should, or they probably don't treat pick one like they treat pick 30. Um, and so our solution for this problem was to go back to our module two output. So remember, this is player performance, cumulative probability distributions. We use k-means clustering two, um, and a filtering method, and we identify like assets. So we end up with seven distinct asset classes uh, that Michael will flip through here. And then we assign a different market price of risk for each of those asset classes. 
We have calibrated these um, using pick for picks trades. There aren't very many of those. More work could be done here to calibrate these values. Uh, but we calibrated them, we interpolated when we needed to, uh, and these were the, the values we came up with. So to interpret this, um, pick one is all by itself. Um, and we have a very risk-seeking market price of risk. So that means teams are willing to pay much more than the expected value. Um, and then for pick 25 and 30, it's very risk-averse uh, parameter. So uh, teams are willing to pay less uh, than the value. So I will say that hopefully that aligns with your intuition when you hear about the trade. You often hear about teams taking risks at pick one, going for upside. At pick 25 and 30, they're looking for role players. They're interested in kind of their base contribution. Okay, so the result, um, we put this all into um, this Wang transform model. Uh, we use this distribution, and we end up with these yellow lines. So you'll notice in the unprotected case, that yellow line is way out to the right. So that tail of that distribution pulled the price way out. In um, the protected case, it's actually relatively close to that expected value. Um, and then these are our prices, right? So it's 43.1 win shares per five years and 21.0. To give you a little more context, you can break that out into a kind of an implied annual win share contribution. Uh, it's 8.6 here, which is 2018 Kemba Walker. Um, in the unprotected case, in the protected case, it's 2018 Tyler Johnson. Um, so for some of you, that will be meaningful and help you understand this. Um, <laughs> the, so the other thing we can do, I mentioned this is kind of a counterfactual situation, excuse me. Um, and we can compare the two and then say, the protection subtracted about 51% of the value of the pick, uh, of that base draft pick. So uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I want to back up and give you some uh, context to the trade that this pick was involved in. Um, so it was the Suns-Sixers-Bucks trade, um, and the Suns uh, traded away that Lakers first round pick in exchange for Brandon Knight um, and Kendall Marshall, who they ended up waiving, I think, immediately. Um, so we'll compare these two. And at the time, uh, this Lakers pick was perceived to be a pretty high value asset. A lot of folks were asking this question, and it's interesting to see Ryan McDonough, who's the GM of the Suns at the time, his response uh, to this question. Um, so he says, with a pick like that, we probably weren't going to receive the pick this year. And this lines up with our model findings. So we end up assessing there's a 78% chance that that pick was going to end up protected in that first year. So he goes on and says, well, that pushes it back next year, and there's a pretty high variance as to what the Lakers, uh, how, uh, what, pick, what the pick could be. Um, and that also lines up with our model. Um, so the Lakers were fourth, the fourth worst team at the time. Suppose they were to finish fourth worst. Um, we estimated the distribution of outcomes the next year was first worst and 24th worst, so sixth best. The median outcome there was eight. And he concludes and says, if you ask me how the Lakers are going to be a year from now, I have no idea. It kind of sounds like the uncertainty uh, was a driving force in this trade, getting rid of this pick. And we can go back and kind of think about what return they got, at least on this one dimension. So like I said, that we priced that protected pick at 4.2 win shares. Um, Brandon Knight, who they got in return, had generated around 4.5 in the previous year and was on track for the same in 2015. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, Brandon Knight uh, was, go back a couple, okay. Brandon Knight was um, about to be a free agent. There's team building considerations. There's all sorts of considerations. But this is another piece of data, I think, to use to analyze possibly past trades or prospective trades. So we've got a bunch of other results. Um, that you can find in the paper, on the poster. Uh, we don't have time to go through them uh, too much here. Um, but one is this Bucks Suns trade. It was the Eric Bledsoe trade in November 2017. The interesting thing there is the, are these low end protections, so 17 through 30. That does some interesting things to the value. Um, hopefully, if we are fortunate enough to have the opportunity to talk tomorrow, uh, we'll input some of this uh, discussion um, into that talk. Um, and then we answer a couple other questions, like what's the value of incremental protections or multiple year protections? Uh, so we call this rollover protections. So for a few uh, discussion points, um, we've used these quantitative methods, hopefully to say something about what the value of um, NBA draft picks are, protected NBA draft picks are. Uh, but I think there's a few ways we could improve our model. And we've built it kind of modularly so we can update methods over time. So the first thing, there's a bunch here, I'll just mention two. Um, one is that the team simulation doesn't really account for player movement right now. There are updated methods that could be used. Um, we had some 
we're working on this project on the side and using personal computers, and so we had some computing constraints um, and time constraints, but we could implement more sophisticated methods here to account for when a team trades a player away, they might get worse, they might get better, um, but there might be a jump in their performance, and we don't account for that currently. Um, and then, uh, I mentioned this in the talk, better calibrating those risk preference parameters um, could be done uh, with some updated methods. The other thing we'd like to do is add some customizability to the, the model. Um, if this is gonna be used by teams as private information to make decisions about pick protections, they may wanna input their own risk preferences, expectations about draft quality or future team performance, or choose a new or different player value metric. Um, and those uh, updates may not, aren't gonna be that difficult, I think, to add in here. Um, so we've mentioned some of these applications. Um, we could analyze past trades, which is what we've kind of done here today. Um, we call this kind of tongue-in-cheek advanced analytics of the front office. The idea there is the front office has had their chance to advance analyze players and coaches, and maybe it's their turn under the microscope. Um, the second uh, would be private information. So this is allowing teams to better negotiate pick protections um, or perhaps target mispriced assets. That's an arbitrage argument that might be hard to make in a market that's like the NBA trade market and is a liquid, but um, it still may be possible. Um, and then the third is a more general idea, a larger a con conceptual idea. And that's to use this framework of MBA assets as financial assets um, and try to price out or value other asset types. Things like bird rights or draft and stash decisions uh, might be able to be maneuvered into this framework. And that's it. If you have any questions, oh, my co author is a Duke fan and I went to Virginia, so I had the opportunity here to put a bunch of Virginia players scoring on Duke. Um, so that's why this is up here. We can now open up for questions. I think maybe you had a follow-up point on it that would be relevant to it, but did you do anything with discounting rates for the player performance? I mean, the front office is a big consideration that's like, well, you know, I'm, I may not be the person to make that pick, so um, so there's, there was that piece. And then also um, the flip side value of, you know, the, the draft pick, as they say, it's, you know, it's, eventually becomes a player, and if that player isn't the player another team likes, it's not as valuable as the pick that was taken to get it, and so there may be some future option value to the pick actually rolling over um, so that you can continue to keep it as a, more of a financial asset rather than a realized asset. Yeah, yeah, there are lots of time considerations here, lots of dimensions that we don't deal with, in part because it's kind of hard for me to think about, kind of from a market perspective, whether assets are more valuable now or later. It's not like money. Um, it's kind of a personal preference thing. So um, we've thought about how we might incorporate it, but it's not explicitly dealt with here on both those dimensions that you're, you're discussing. Um, but it might not, it probably isn't that hard if we could come up with a way that we think actually represents the world um, and how teams make decisions. Any more questions? All right. Well, thank you to Ben and his co-author, Michael.